Okay, here's the long overdue outline for the problem solution essay. I know a lot of you, like me, are getting used to online uh, distance learning modules. I'm sick of it, uh, but I wanted to give you something as close to a step-by-step -step process. This is if you're working on the modest proposal essay for EN 102, or if you're working on the personal problem solution essay. I'm going to deliberately try to pick examples from both categories. But either way, it's the same basic structure for the essay. This PowerPoint's designed to just literally take you point for point through what I'm looking for on this next creative problem solving essay. So throughout this outline, I'm gonna lean on one particular example that I got from an essay that was maybe two or three years old from an EN 100 class. So this was the personal problem solution essay, but it was a clear cut a, right? It was an obvious A paper that had all of the points that I'd need for an A, but it was also pretty easy to understand. It wasn't overly complex. It was relatively simple. So as I use that kind of personal example, don't forget if you're in the STEM class working on that modest proposal essay, all the exact same rules apply. If you're literally going to follow the PowerPoint along step for step, you know, like pausing, uh, working on the essay, coming back to it, I'd recommend kind of doing that frequently in small chunks. If you literally want to follow along step by step, I built this PowerPoint to match with the outline on the directions. So if you have either the modest proposal essay directions or the personal problem solution essay directions, you both got the same outline. And the beginning of the outline looks like this in the bottom half of the slide. So if you want to have that nearby, that's the structure that I'm using. That's the path that we're following. And maybe just visually, it's a little bit easier to figure out where we're at in the lesson. All right, I'm already sick of the last uh, presentation art and clip art that I had set up. So we're back to basics. From now on, it's just going to be black and white, uh, white text on a black background, old movie style. So here we go. Here's a step-by-step -step approach to the next essay, the problem solution essay. Step one sounds simple. Um, it's literally just brainstorm a list of as many topics as you possibly can. But this actually already requires a little bit of stamina and a little bit of patience. So you'll come up with three or four boring topics. Uh, they'll just kind of fall out of your brain, the paper that you wrote about in 12th grade for your research project or the paper you wrote for me in EN 100. Jot those down, but really spend enough time. I'd recommend maybe 10 or 15 minutes really trying to come up with as many topics as possible so that you just know when you choose your final topic, it's a little bit more unique to you. It's a little bit more specific to your own interests. Maybe it's something you've been researching from another class and you can borrow gently from some research that you've already done. So do take the time to just think through a lot of topics so you can pick one you feel good about. So whether you're writing the EN 100 version of the essay or the STEM EN 102 version of the essay, choosing an original topic is your first opportunity to show off some creativity. So if you can come up with an original, interesting topic that is focused and less familiar, that's it. That's you already doing a little bit of lateral thinking and showing off some originality of thought. Okay, in terms of possible topics, here's way too much text on one screen. Um, if you want to just pause here and kind of try to assess the difference between left and right, go ahead and do that now and I'll explain the difference in the next slide. So if you were playing along and you noticed that the left hand side were problems and objectives that are local, immediate to you, and most importantly, they're the kind of problem you could solve as an individual. That's the main difference between the essay for the EN 100 crew and the EN STEM 102 crew is EN 100, you're writing essays about problems that you could solve as a single individual person. If you're in the STEM class, you're writing the exact same paper, but you're also taking into account the scope of the problem. That's a problem that might need a lot of people to solve, that might need coordination, and is by definition going to be more complex. So on the left, just so you got some sample topic ideas in the back of your brain. Uh, top one on the left, how do I pass my anatomy and physiology class during the COVID-19 crisis? I picked that because I'm sure it's true for at least a few of you, and it gives you the idea that that's an immediate 
practical problem. That's something you actually need to deal with in real life anyway. So maybe you get to use the essay as a way to work out a few different ways of approaching that problem. Uh, skim down to something a little more heavy or more serious. I'm worried about my brother's drinking. Seems like he's been getting worse since we're stuck at home at COVID. And so maybe that's the problem. It's not your problem specifically, but it's something that's on your mind and it's something that you might want to talk about in an essay. Skip to the very bottom left. I don't know. I think I might be addicted to the internet. I've been stuck at home alone with my own thoughts for this long and I've been on the computer doing things like writing this exact presentation for 10 to 15 hours a day, maybe I have a problem. Okay, good. Those are the kinds of topics that could work well for the EN100 class. If you're in the STEM class, look to the right-hand side of the board. The rest of you can go back to your cell phones. Um, you have similar kinds of topics. I deliberately tried to mirror these, but if you're in the EN102 STEM class, you're picking something larger scale that might need coordination and teamwork to solve the problem. So left-hand side, those are problems you could solve individually. Right-hand side, those are problems you could solve as a group. I'm gonna make a big eat your vegetables suggestion that you spend a lot of time trying to brainstorm topics, whether you're in the 100 or the 102. If you can come up with more than five topics just to start with, it just makes it easier for you because you pick a topic or a combination of topics that seems a little easier, a little more straightforward, or just a little bit more interesting uh, that makes the essay easier inevitably. Step two sounds obvious, but I know I'm going to lose some of you on this step. You're not going to spend enough time just gathering enough sources so you can feel really pretty confident about one in particular. So I really do try to take your time at this particular moment in the essay. One way you could go about it is to just pick the topic that seems like what's on your mind anyway, the thing that you're thinking about most for many of us, that's probably going to be COVID related or COVID adjacent. Uh, but for instance, maybe you've noticed you've been spending more and more time online. You're starting to suspect that you have a problem. And maybe you decide you're going to make the main point of your paper. Hi, my name is Chris and I'm addicted to the internet. So of course, from here, you could just barrel into actually writing the essay itself. You've got your topic, you know how you want to approach the topic. I'm going to recommend at least a few steps in between picking the topic and just blasting right into the essay itself. I'd spend a little time trying to analyze the problem separately. So you're deliberately trying to do some brainstorming on different elements of the problem. Definitely spend some time thinking about causes and sub causes of the problem. I'll get to sub causes in a second. Uh, and then, of course, looking at the consequences. So what are the effects of the problem? How do they manifest in the real world? And that'll give you a chance to show off both the logical part of the essay as well as the lateral thinking and creativity. So if we were doing the full high octane version of this class in a seated situation, I would actually slow down a lot more here. I would talk about these terms being on quizzes. I'd talk about how important it is to know the distinction between these terms. But I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly just because I really only need you to know how these terms are gonna be applied to the essay, especially if you're going for a B or higher on the problem solution essay. So real quick, causes are obvious. This is if you're driving along in your car, you notice that it's windy out and you also see the windmills, the blades on the windmills are turning and you just logically conclude, ah, when it's windy, the blades on the giant windmill go round and round. So I'm gonna conclude the proximate cause is the wind, that's the thing that creates the effect, which is the blades of the turbine going around. Subcauses are important and they can be annoying because they sound a little bit like if you have some little brothers and sisters and they play the why game with you, you have some little nieces, nephews, children in your life, and you give them an explanation, like why are the blades and the giant fan moving? And you say, well, it's because of the wind. The sub cause is when the kid plays the why game. Yes, but what makes the wind blow? What is the cause of the wind blowing? And that's a really important moment because the kid is gonna eventually figure out, you don't know, you'll say something about air pressure and the equal distribution thereof and the atmospheric disequilibrium. And eventually they're gonna get to a point and they'll say, but why that? And then they'll laugh with glee because you'll say, I don't know, or you'll get angry at them. So they're kind of looking forward to you getting stymied, to you getting frustrated because you can only take the chain of causality back 
a certain number of links. This isn't perfect, but it's a pretty decent visualization of what I mean when I say causal chain. So causal chain implies you've got multiple links, multiple elements in play. And if you're looking at this carefully and closely, any one effect has multiple causes. And you could think of it as moving back on the chain is playing that Y game. Well, yes, but what caused this cause? Give me the explanation of that. And you can take that back uh, to an almost absurd degree. If some of you are already thinking in that direction, I like where your head's at. So in case any of you are getting annoyed that I'm mostly using the EN100 example for talking through the problem solution essay, the having an addiction to the internet is the problem you're gonna solve. If you're one of my STEM students and you're getting a little anxious about that, here's a diagram that is a visualization of what a possible topic for this modest proposal essay could look like. In other words, this is totally appropriate as a topic, global warming, climate change, anything involving environmental science, very useful topic for this kind of an essay. And if you're reading this closely, there's a lot going on here, but you're seeing a visualization of a lot of what's important about this modest proposal essay, especially if you're approaching it as a STEM student. In terms of the actual essay itself, there's really only a few basic things I need you to know about causes versus subcauses. So if you think of writing your essay about climate change, it's pretty obvious that the effect you're talking about is the actual warming. And you can get a lot of consensus on that. You can get more scientists to agree that the earth is warming than that the earth is round. And you could say, well, the most immediate cause has to do with this sort of scientific explanation, uh, heat being trapped, the greenhouse effect, how that is kind of a feedback loop. And you can get most scientists to go along with you as well. And you could also get most scientists to this next, what I would consider the most, the next immediate cause, right? So I'm going to skip the scientific explanation. You don't have to get that fine grain in your essay. But the connection between CO2 and the warming of the planet is the first kind of important moment or the first link in the chain. And then the question is, well, what's causing CO2 emissions to rise? The reason that I say sub-causes are important is because they could totally change the way you're going to try to solve the problem. So we got most of the scientists to agree that CO2 is the proximate cause of warming. That gets us a pretty direct route to the Earth gradually warming over time. But for instance, if you think that's natural, if you think it's just part of these cycles that the Earth goes through warming and cooling, ice ages, tropical ages, then you're gonna have a very different set of potential solutions. You're actually gonna think more about risk mitigation. You're gonna think about how to minimize the damage um, and the kind of the financial burden of climate change. If however, you think that the sub cause, the thing that's causing the rise in CO2 is actually human activity. In other words, you think the sub cause is man-made and our release of CO2 into the atmosphere, that means you might be less interested in these kinds of solutions that have to do with adapting with the consequences of the problem. And you might be more interested in trying to mitigate the causes of the problem before you have to deal with the effects. So it totally changes your flowchart. If you think it is man-made, then your solutions are gonna to tend to focus on prevention. How can we keep it from getting worse? If you think it is not man-made, it is just a totally normal process of the life cycle of the planet, you're going to skip that and you're just going to start talking about saving money. If any of you started to get a little itchy and a little antsy at the end of that last graphic because it was getting a little crowded and noisy and overly complex, let me just give you one last point about causes versus sub causes. It's totally appropriate to look at this graph and make that same kind of seven year old uh, complaint, play the seven-year-old why game. Well, we know that global warming is a thing and that it's happening. We've got an immediate scientific cause and an explanation. Then we've got the kind of immediate proximate cause that leads to that chemical reaction. Maybe we have consensus uh, as to the cause of that additional CO2 in the air. And a few of you might be smart enough to be thinking, wait a minute, can't you just keep playing the why game forever? Can't you just keep taking that causal chain all the way back, maybe even to the beginning of time or the creation of the universe? The answer is yes, yes you can. And if you wanted to get into that uh, hall of mirrors, 
This is what that nightmare flowchart would look like. I'm not showing this to intimidate you. I'm just showing you this so that you know you don't have to go anything close to this level of detail. You're only going one link back in the chain. You only have to go one sub cause deep into the analysis of where your problem came from. But be aware that the world is complex and very nuanced. And if you really try to map this out, you realize how interconnected every cause and effect actually are. Even though I'm hoping a few of you wanted to get philosophical and get into root cause or first cause, fantastic. But don't forget, you do not have to go into anything close to this level of detail for the actual essay. For this essay in particular, it's way simpler than that. All you're worried about is making sure you've talked about the problem in detail. You've talked about one immediate cause of the problem and just make an effort to go one sub cause deeper than that. So make sure you've talked about an initial obvious cause, but you've also gotten a little bit into a possible cause of that proximate cause. The reason that's important, even though it sounds syntactically snarky, is it really does change your solutions. So these solutions look good if your cause is that it's not man-made. These solutions are much more immediate, practical, and useful if you think that global warming is man-made. So how you identify the problem will change how you solve it. So just to bring it back down to basics, uh, all you're doing in this essay is trying to show off intelligent problem solving. That requires the creativity where you're able to stick with an idea and approach it from multiple ways. That's lateral thinking. But the cause and effect logic is a much more rigorous, intelligent, analytical approach. That's what we were doing as we tried to break down a few extra links in the causal chain. So they're designed deliberately to kind of work out the same muscle group. If step three felt a little too intellectual or overly rational, or like the introduction to a logic class, it kind of was, and that's okay. You may actually prefer step four. If you're a more traditionally creative person, you like open-minded thinking, you like kind of blue sky creativity and outside the box approaches to things, this may actually appeal to you a little bit more. And in this case, I'm actually gonna suggest that you follow along in writing. That being said, let's try it. Go to get a pen or pencil, piece of paper, something to write with. Open up a new window if you want to you know, like type these as notes. Um, here, I think it's actually genuinely valuable to go through the motions and like physically either type or write some of your answers down as opposed to just try to think about them. There's something about making them concrete, either through typing or through handwriting, that may reinforce the musculature that we're trying to touch here. So if you're actually gonna try this at home, we're back to the internet addiction example. So just pretend you're writing your problem solution essay on the problem of internet addiction. And literally all I need you to do in writing is give yourself as much time as you want. It could be five minutes, 10 minutes, go for a half hour if you need it, but make sure you create at least 10 potential solutions. I'm saying 10, very specifically, because the first three or four will be easy. Next three or four will be a little bit more of a challenge. They may start to get weird or repetitive. Force yourself all the way to 10. That's, those are the extra three reps that your brain will need. And if it's kind of weird or boring or uncomfortable, that's just because your brain might not be used to it. So go ahead, give yourself as much time as you want. Uh, make sure you can come up with at least 10 possible solutions to the problem of internet addiction. Okay, just count them up at this point. Honestly, if you have five or more, you should be fine for the essay. It means you can come up with kind of three baselines and then two or three additional possible solutions. And that might be all you need. Um, if you came up with 10 or more, that just gives you more options. Compare your list to this list here. This is kind of like an example of if I gave this exercise in a classroom of 25 students, very quickly as a class, they would be able to come up with more than 10. They would blast past 15 pretty quickly. In most classes, you'll get 20 to 25 separate and distinct solutions uh, to the same problem. So an obvious point to make there is that's what uh, think tanks are all about. Five of you is more creative than one of you individually. And so when you see a list like this, I'm not expecting you as an individual to come up with 20 possible solutions, but just know that it is possible. And the more people you add, the more lateral the thoughts may get. 
compare your list to this list and first of all, just see if there's any overlap. Did you come up with a solution that somebody else came up with? Good, that means you're both coming up with good ideas. Also note to yourself if you came up with an idea that's actually on this list, but you didn't write it down. So for instance, maybe you very briefly thought about blinding yourself as a way to avoid the temptation of screen time, but your brain immediately said, nah, that's too weird, too gross, too bizarre for me, and you just set it aside. The whole point of brainstorming is just make sure you allow as many ideas into the mix as possible. So depending on how much time you spent on step four, step five can be pretty easy because all you're doing is picking three solutions that you want to talk about. Pick a weird one that's obviously lateral and creative, kind of outside the box and therefore, you know, potentially uh, dangerous or bizarre. Pick a middle of the road one that may have some aggressive elements, but also has some practical logistics. And I'd say the third one isn't necessarily the best solution. That's what the directions imply, but it's the solution that you feel best about. So if you came up with a weird solution that you actually think would have traction, choose that one. Choose the solution, whether it's for a personal problem or a modest proposal, you know, larger societal problem, pick the solution that you think is actually most likely to work. So the essay moves towards an absurd solution that's very creative and very lateral, but not necessarily likely to succeed, uh, middle of the road, and then the one that you feel most strongly about. So the essay can have kind of a persuasive element in that you're moving towards convincing us, the readers, as to why your third solution is the one that you feel most strongly about. So now you just want to skim the list and kind of see what your options are, see uh, which solutions you may actually want to work with in the essay itself. You could go either way. You could go through and there may be an obvious best solution that you know is gonna be your third practical solution. Uh, I like to go through and look for the weird ones first because that's where the lateral thinking is. That can actually be kind of fun to think about these weird, bizarre scenarios. So immediately something like joining the Amish uh, would catch my eye. That sounds like an interesting scenario. I'd kind of like to practice thinking about what that might actually look like. Right this very moment, I'm thinking that I would like to destroy my computer in a cathartic expression of hostility and rage, a la the movie Office Space. That's that's actually me right now. Um, you'd be amazed at how many people come up with some kind of version of electric shock collar, electrodes, operant conditioning. So that one could be interesting. I've actually read this essay before, and since this essay got an A, I'm just gonna tell you that what this person chose was the ayahuasca sessions in South America to quote, unplug. So essentially this person is going to pick the weird scenario of going to South America, taking powerful hallucinogens and hoping that there's some long-term therapeutic benefit. So maybe we settle on that one as our weird solution. So at this point we know what the weirdest bizarre solution is. So we've decided uh, that's gonna be taking powerful hallucinogens in the jungles of South America. All right, there's the weird lateral solution number one. Now all I have to do next is figure out a practical middle of the road solution. Uh, I'm looking at things like uh, internet addiction support group, uh, just because it's got some obvious therapeutic advantages, but also has some stigma. So it's got some, some pros and cons uh, built into it. And this one's related. I'd say these two are similar um, traditional cognitive behavioral therapy, that's what you get if you just go into a normal treatment program. That's kind of a very common way to deal with baseline addiction. So I feel like those are good kind of middle of the road options. So I think what I would do is I would combine the two of those into my middle solution because I would describe that as something like the traditional therapeutic approach. Now don't forget for your third solution, you're not trying to present your most brilliant solution or the one that you know represents you, know, you as a theoretical innovative genius. You're presenting the solution that you actually think would work best in real life. So whether you're writing this as a personal problem solving essay or the modest proposal social problems essay, it doesn't matter. You pick the solution that you actually think is most likely to succeed based on your own understanding of the real world. 
So based on that, I'd be looking at options that have to do with maybe creating a schedule or setting a time lock and maybe using some kind of extra application like time well spent. And if you don't know that that's a real app, I recommend you check it out. It's pretty fantastic. So, you know, those are maybe a little weaker than some of the more aggressive solutions, but they also may have a greater likelihood of succeeding on the basis of being less invasive. At this point, we've narrowed it down. We know what the essay is about. We've got three solutions to the problem that we've described using some cause and effect logic. And really now it's just kind of a process of plug in the information in the order that the outline demands. Just in terms of pacing and fatigue, if you're getting a little frustrated, I think we're coming up on the 25 minute mark. Hopefully you figured out you probably shouldn't do this in one sitting. I definitely have figured out we shouldn't be doing this in one sitting. But if you're worried that we're only now at step six, starting the actual essay, if you were following step by step, you should be more than halfway done. Because as I said, really, it's just about plugging the information into the formula from here on in. If you're like me, the process of getting started, like from scratch, that very first sentence, that's the worst. That's the most intimidating part of writing is the very first couple sentences that's the worst inertia to get over for me, and I know for many of you too. One thing to say, no wrong way to start the essay. So you can start this literally however you want, as long as you eventually get to a thesis, you could start with a narrative. It's day three and I'm still in my parents' basement. I haven't seen the sun for 72 hours. My face is pale and all I can see is the neon screen in front of me. Tell it like a little story, paint a little scene, little picture, kind of describe the problem narratively first, totally fair. You don't have to do that. You could go philosophical and you could say, since time began, man has been wrestling with technology and making sure that he was in control of technology, but control, the technology was not in control of him. And you mention a Gandhi quote or something. Quotes also, by the way, totally fair way to start. If you wanna use somebody else's language, um, start with a quote that deliberately gets people thinking in the direction you want them to go. As long as you give an attribution, tell me where that quote came from, totally fair. Does not matter as long as by the end of that intro paragraph, I know your basic topic and I have a sense of where the essay is going. How is this essay going to approach solving that problem? Oh, I forgot. One last thing to say about the intro paragraph is just be mindful of your tone and stay consistent with your tone. So since you can write about such a wide variety of topics, somebody who's writing an essay about their brother's addiction to pain medication, that essay is going to have a totally different flavor and a different tone than somebody who's writing about the rise of hipsters and how they're ruining America for their STEM essay. Um, so you can have any tone you want. It can be light, could be ironic, could be very serious and introspective. As long as you stay consistent, you set that tone up in the intro and stick with it, that should enhance your message. If you're just looking to pass the paper, you just want a C minus or better, it'd be fine to go from the intro paragraph where you set up your thesis, I know your main idea, and then go straight from the intro into solution. So your first body paragraph is literally, my first solution to this problem is blank. That could pass you, right? As long as you got three pages of describing the solutions, you'd be good to go at that stage. If you're shooting for a B or higher, make sure you include step seven, which is problem elaboration. This could be one paragraph, two paragraphs, three paragraphs, but here's where you're trying to show off the cause and effect logic. You wanna make sure you uh, focused your problem. So whatever you decided was your issue, maybe you established that you're gonna talk about coronavirus in your intro. You wanna make sure you've been deliberate in choosing the scope of the problem. So coronavirus, that's too big. It's really too big a problem to write a three to five page essay on. So instead you narrow it down and make it clear it's the shortage of ventilators or personal protective equipment in New York State that I'm going to talk about and my solutions will be geared towards that. So making sure you take time to elaborate on the problem, show off the cause and effect, that will change how I perceive your solutions because I know different solutions will deal with different aspects or elements of the problem. So don't skip step seven if you're looking for a B or higher. Step eight really is the meat of the entire essay. So I'm not gonna spend as much time on this 
as you should in the sense that this is going to be at least half of your essay. I'd recommend maybe two thirds of your essay is the solutions with the elements of the solutions, the implementation, comparing and contrasting pros and cons of each solution. That really is the meat of your essay. So even though I'm letting you do a lot of the work there, I'm not going to explain it in as much detail because I want to kind of see how you work this out. It should be pretty self-explanatory. So you've gone through your three solutions. You've given me some pros and cons for each solution. You've compared them and contrasted them. You've ended with the solution that you think is most likely to succeed. Step nine, I should have made this step three because I'm teetering on the edge of burnout. But seriously, step nine is go do some deep stretching. If you haven't already, take a walk, phone a friend. The fatigue is getting to me. I can't imagine how you feel. I sat down to write this PowerPoint thinking hour and a half, maybe two hours max. I can knock this presentation out. Going to be a piece of cake. As I sit here narrating right now, it's 11 hours later and I still hate it. I still hate this presentation. There's so much I want to change. There's so much that I know I could make better. Point I'm trying to make there is make progress on the essay. It's more important that you write the essay than it be perfect because if I waited to make this presentation perfect, if I tweaked it to get it exactly up to my own standards, it would be June before you saw it. So go ahead, make some progress, but take care of yourself in the meantime. Okay, you've done your deep breathing, you've done some yoga stretching, you're feeling fresh. All that's left is the concluding paragraph. And honestly, you're 95% of the way there. There is less pressure on a concluding paragraph for an essay like this than there might be for a straightforward persuasive essay where you really need to stick the landing. Uh, your last solution is essentially sticking the landing. The concluding paragraph can be uh, pretty low pressure. So you might talk about the likelihood of success of the solution ultimately, like if it was put into effect in the real world, would it actually work? Uh, when I say solution prognosis, that's just a fancy term for its likelihood of succeeding in the wild. Uh, maybe this is a retrospective essay. You're writing about a solution you already tried. You can just use the concluding paragraph to reflect. Uh, did that solution work? Did your approach towards asking the girl out get the outcome and the solution that you were looking for? Or did it crash and burn horribly? So you can have this concluding paragraph look like a few different things. It's got less pressure grade wise than the intro by far. So if you're to this stage, you can be pretty casual and cavalier about just wrapping up your conversation, revisiting some main themes and giving me some final reflection. Steps 11 through 15 are optional, kind of. Uh, look, a few of you just went through steps one through 10. You got to the last sentence of the last paragraph. You throw a period down there and you already wrote an A minus. Like you may not have to proofread much. There's a percentage of you that can just write a B plus A minus paper in one sitting. And that's not many of you. It's definitely not me. And the majority of you should at least do some drafts. Um, if nothing else, sit on the paper for a day or two, reread it out loud to yourself with a pen or pencil in your hand, and you'll catch mistakes. Your ear will catch mistakes that your eyes might have just skimmed over otherwise. Definitely recommend giving it to a friend to kind of proofread, look over, make suggestions. Definitely suggesting give me the entire paper in advance or pieces of your paper. Those of you that are doing that are very quickly figuring out. You can zero in on a grade pretty quickly. You send me the paper through email. I send it back to you with suggestions. You make some changes. Maybe you do that two or three times. Uh, and pretty easy to zero in on your target grade, as long as you're willing to be patient, proofread where necessary. So as your English teacher, there's your eat your vegetables moment. Eat your vegetables, sit up tall and don't slouch and definitely proofread and draft your paper multiple times. And that finally gets us to the end. I hope you didn't make the mistake of trying to watch this video in one sitting, just like I made the mistake of trying to narrate this in one eight hour marathon. So let's take a lesson from my mistake and make sure you break your essay into smaller chunks, work on it episodically over a longer period of time, uh, try not to tackle it in one marathon session because that's just not good for anybody's mental health. Speaking of mental health, be good to each other out there. Take care. Uh, Self-care is a real thing. As always, email if you have any questions. Let me know how I can help. All right, I'm out.